Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, August 1st. So it's one thing to talk about it, but it's a whole other thing to do something about it. And so that's what we are doing here today. Mayoral candidate Willie Wilson gives away more cash and comes under new scrutiny. Protesters are poised to take over Wrigleyville tomorrow. The organizers are here to tell us why. A new survey ranks Chicago the rat, rat capital of the country. Is that really true? And what is being done about it? A mysterious box of photographs inspires a globe-trotting art show. Jeffrey Bear looks back at a 1999 art display that moved Chicagoans in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. I could feel my heart beating faster. And it was like getting a letter from Abraham Lincoln or something. And a rare look at Northwestern University's collection of handwritten Beatles lyrics. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. A sudden resignation in Springfield following some sordid allegations. Eddie Aruza has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Eddie. Phil, first-term Republican State Representative Nick Sauer, who was a member of the Illinois House Sexual Discrimination and Harassment Task Force, stepped down this afternoon after a former girlfriend accused him of posting naked pictures of her online. Sauer did not confirm or deny those accusations as he submitted a letter of resignation this afternoon. In that letter, the 35-year-old Lake Barrington Republican identifies his former girlfriend as Kate Kelly, who claims Sauer opened an Instagram account using her photos allegedly to engage in sexual conversations with other men. According to Politico, Kelly has filed formal complaints against Sauer with the Chicago Police Department and the Office of the Legislative Inspector General. Governor Bruce Rauner calls the resignation the right thing to do. Well, some newly unsealed information from a 2015 search warrant reveals more damaging allegations against Cook County Circuit Court Clerk Dorothy Brown. An FBI search of a cell phone belonging to one of Brown's former employees contained information saying Brown received cash payoffs from employees which she picked up at her alleged bagman's home. The phone, which belonged to former associate clerk Bina Patel, also revealed that Patel resigned after learning she was expected to make monetary contributions to Dorothy Brown as part of her employment. The new information came as U.S. District Judge Sarah Ellis ruled the FBI had probable cause to seize and search Patel's phone. Brown and her office have been part of an ongoing federal investigation, but her attorney today tells the Chicago Tribune that the latest revelations are, quote, sensationalized. Dorothy Brown is among the 10 candidates running for mayor of Chicago. At this hour, a mass of Thanksgiving is being celebrated at the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Des Plaines, following what some are calling a miracle in Mexico. This was the scene inside Aeromexico Flight 2431 that crashed in Durango, Mexico yesterday as it tried taking off during a severe storm. The plane came down in a field shortly after it left the runway, but all 103 passengers and crew members amazingly survived. Among those on board were 15 Chicago area residents, including Father Esquiel Sanchez, who's the rector of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Des Plaines. Father San Sanchez sustained numerous fractures, but is expected to fully recover. He tells ABC7 that the flight crew was to be highly commended for quickly evacuating everyone from the burning plane. Mexican authorities are now investigating the cause of that crash. As for the weather, expect scattered thunderstorms tonight, then becoming partly cloudy with a low around 67. Tomorrow, just a slight chance of showers and thunderstorms with a high around 83. And a reminder that you can watch Chicago Tonight in a variety of ways, streamed on Facebook via podcast and the PBS video app, as well as online at WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight. And now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Eddie. Another day, another cash giveaway by mayoral candidate Willie Wilson and 
another problem. A watchdog group has taken action against the Wilson campaign for alleged unethical and improper behavior. Paris Schutz has the latest, and Paris, what exactly is the issue? Well, Phil Wilson was at the county building today giving away $500 apiece to people who were paying the second installment of their property taxes at the county treasurer's office, but he's facing scrutiny for a similar event that took place about a week and a half ago where he gave away $300,000 of his foundation's money at a church. Now, the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform has filed a former complaint, formal complaint with the Illinois Elections Board to find the Wilson campaign and make him disclose that $300,000 as a campaign contribution. What they say is this event had mayoral politics written all over it, Phil. The money may have come from his foundation, but his campaign promoted the event and he streamed the event on his campaign Facebook page. So they look at this as a campaign event where the money should have to be recorded as a donation. If this was just a give back to the community, which that's great. I, we think, you know, there's nothing against Willie personally about him wanting to support the neighborhood folks around Chicago. Um, but at the same time, how could this be, how could this be distinguished from his campaign and his candidacy for mayor? He is um, using sort of these events to um, secure favor from voters. And so how could those two really be separate? So any reaction from the Wilson campaign today? No immediate reaction. The ICPR's action came after Willie Wilson was handing out checks this morning at the county building. And the campaigns insisted that they've done nothing wrong here. And indeed, the Illinois Elections Board initially found no wrongdoing from this event a week and a half ago, as long as that money was coming from the foundation, not the campaign. But as we see today, the ICPR is urging the election board to look at this again in light of their complaint, possibly find the Wilson campaign and make him record that money as a campaign contribution. They're also questioning the legality or the appearance of Governor Bruce Rauner's $100,000 contribution to the foundation, given that some of that money was ostensibly part of this giveaway last week. But Wilson says he's been doing this for years, and this is in no way tied to his mayoral campaign. People are trying to survive. Uh, taxes is just too high. We must protect our citizen. And my wife and I, we're not going to just, we're not just talking about it. You know, we're sharing our resources uh, with the people in the, uh, in, in the community. Now, a lot of the folks at this event today say that they would vote for Willie Wilson for mayor. Consequently, they were saying it wasn't the cash giveaway that influenced their vote. They were probably already going to be Wilson voters. Now, Wilson, of course, is one of 10 candidates for mayor, as Eddie mentioned earlier, including Dorothy Brown, who's facing her own problems, incumbent mayor Rahm Emanuel, Troy Laravie, and uh, Paul Vallis, Lori Lightfoot, to, to name a few. Uh, Lightfoot also uh, complained, filed a complaint today about Wilson's action. Paris, thank you. And now to Carol Marine and the organizers of tomorrow's controversial Northside March. Carol. Phil, thank you. About a month ago, protesters shut down the Dan Ryan Expressway on the south side in the name of fighting gun violence. Tomorrow, activists are taking their voices to the north side to protest police-involved shootings. The plan? To shut down four lanes of traffic on Lakeshore Drive and march on Belmont Avenue and Clark Street in the heart of Wrigleyville and onto Wrigley Field. What are their demands? Chiefly, the resignations of Mayor Rahm Emanuel, excuse me, and Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson. Joining us are the organizers of tomorrow's protest, Tio Hardiman, who leads the violence mediation nonprofit Violence Interrupters, and Reverend Gregory Seal Livingston, interim pastor. <coughs> I'm just going to cough my way through this, forgive me, at New, <coughs> New Hope Baptist. <coughs> Mr. Hardiman, what's the plan? Well, the plan is to redistribute the pain here in Chicago because the African-American community continues to suffer. Uh, we're, we're on the bottom of the totem pole when it comes down to receiving our fair share of state and city contracts. 85% of all the homicides that occur in Chicago occur in the African-American community. Uh, we would like to, for the whole city to understand that we are tired. That's why we're coming to the north side with our message. Uh, the police should be involved in more de-escalation training here in Chicago. There have been too many shootings where the police kill African-American men in particular, and the killings were not justified. So what we plan to do tomorrow is to uh, shut down Lakeshore Drive and hold a press conference because we're tired of it. Over 300 people have been killed in Chicago so far this year. Over 1,400 people have been shot. 
Every year in Chicago for the last 30 years, there have been an average of over 500 homicides, and billions of dollars have been spent to help reduce violence, but what's really going on? So we plan to really call out a lot of individuals, organizations, and really uh, make a strong statement tomorrow. Uh, everything needs to come to an end. Reverend Livingston, have you talked to police about this? No, <clears throat> not at all. And the reason being is that we're doing this in the spirit of Dr. King. You know, our march is tomorrow, 4 o'clock, Belmont and Lakeshore. But when Dr. King, the 52nd anniversary of the Marquette Park March is August 5th, believe me, he did not strategize with Richard J. Daley. He did not strategize with the police chief at that time. They did it because they felt it was right. The same thing with the march in Cicero, September 2nd. And he takes that from Gandhi. The British Crown did not approve of any of Gandhi's tactics and marches, but he understood what it meant to do that in terms of inspiring the uninspired. And so you not talk to police. Is it going to be nonviolent? Yes. Yeah, this is a, a peaceful demonstration. We have qualified African American leaders that can organize a peaceful demonstration here in Chicago and nationwide. We we have a lot of demands that we want met here. We definitely want the de-escalation training. And then also let me say this the face of violence prevention in Chicago right now is guys like Arnie Duncan and Tenny Gross. Arnie Duncan received $90 million for violence prevention. What makes Arnie Duncan a violence prevention expert? And secondly, with $90 million, I can hire every young man on every corner in Chicago for the next 30 years. We have to organize and unify in order to stop and reduce gun violence in Chicago. And everybody in the city should play a role, everybody. One of the things that you've said is that you want the resignation of the mayor and the resignation of the superintendent of police, Eddie Johnson. Realistically, that's not going to happen. Well, that's what they say, and everything is impossible until it does happen. Ask the Wright brothers. We never know what's going to happen. We have to do the right thing. I mean, Rahm Emanuel is sitting on a half billion dollars in HUD money, and that money for low-income housing could have been used to help people's lives, and helping people's lives in terms of where they can live will reduce violence, but then he has a $1 billion slush, I mean, TIF fund that he is handing out money to his developer cronies. You know, Eddie and, and Rom did not start corruption, but we cannot allow them to perpetuate that corruption as well because it is my belief, it is our belief that we cannot talk about violence and ignore the corrupt tree that produces it. Because this wait, 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 yes. help me with that. Yes. Because, I mean, one, we're talking about violence, mm -hmm. and in your case, they're talking, you're talking about police involved violence, well, well, right? Well, black on black violence, blue on black violence, sure. Okay, so what does that have to do with, the corru with corruption? Well, because corruption, misallocates resources. You know, we talk anti-poverty, but you talk about intentionally segregating this, this city, which we have had, you know. Dr. King said this is the most segregated city he's ever been in, and what really has changed since that time? And so then we have a, a mayor who closes 50 schools at one time, destabilizes neighborhoods, has no vision for reusing and repurposing those schools. We have a mayor that covers up a murder, Laquan McDonald. We have a mayor who's out there hiring illegitimately a police superintendent, a man who didn't want the job in the first place. So, I mean, it strikes me that you've got multiple messages that don't necessarily all merge. Well, no, right? no, the messages merge. Let me say this. Mm -hmm. All of the messages merge for sure. The violence is too high in Chicago. We need to take a look at what's going on in Boston, where the homicide rate was cut all the way down to maybe 30 homicides a year. In Los Angeles, homicides are way down. New York and, and L.A. combined, uh, they don't even have a name, the number of homicides we have in Chicago. So we're marching against the violence in the community. We're marching against police violence. And we're marching for economic development on the southeast and west sides of Chicago. If you drive down 79th Street to Yates, no economic development. Madison and Pulaski, 16th and Lawndale, we so have issues So what does Wrigleyville have to do with that? Where's the connection to Lakeshore Drive and Belmont and Wrigleyville? We're marching to Wrigleyville, to, to Wrigleyville you know, where the Cubs play, and we're going to march down there in peace just to educate people, and maybe a lot of people on the north side will feel good enough to join forces with us because we're all from, you know, Chicago is our town. And we want Chicago to be safe for everybody. The same way people are living their lives on the north side, we want the same type of resources on the west, east, and, and the south side of Potential Chicago. Potential for this to backfire on you? Mm, we're not too worried about that. We expect 
people to be angry and upset. You know, I always tell my church, we're all just above ground dirt. We eat dirt to stay out of the dirt. And so, you know, in, in biology teaches us that in order to have mutation or change, you need irritation. The doctor has to tell you, if you don't start eating right, if you don't exercise, you're not going to be here long. So human nature is such that there's a push that has to happen. And I believe in the intrinsic goodness of all of us. But I think sometimes that we can become numb or comfortable. And so we go to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So you're talking in, on the one hand about educating people and on the other hand sort of having other people feel the pain. That's, well, that's old that's school a, education. We, this, we're redistributing yeah. the pain, right. Right. the anguish, and the dormant hope. Because, you know, we want to bring Southsiders and Westsiders and other people from challenge areas and those of goodwill up to that area and show them what a prosperous and well-funded neighborhood it looks like. Yeah. Show them what an optimally, optimally functioning police district looks like. Then they can go back with a different level of satisfaction because I grew up here. I was scared to go downtown when I was a kid. There were things I was never exposed to until I was grown and put out there. But I can tell you there are so many in the community that 40, 50 years never leave there and exposure is one of the keys. Or flip side, Lakeview residents and Wrigleyville residents can come marching Inglewood and Austin. Let me just... what's, what's the difference between your march and what Father Flager did in the Dan Ryan? Well, the difference is we're marching right in the middle of rush hour traffic. Lapapalooza is uh, starting tomorrow, and we're taking it to the north side. What about building a $95 million youth academy instead of a $95 million police academy? And I want to say this as well. If we were to take uh, $63 million, for example, hypothetically speaking, and we were to hire, let's say, about 50,000 young people in Chicago at $12 an hour, we can put these young people to work. That's the difference. You have a lot of well-to-do people on the north side of Chicago and all over the city to a degree. I'm talking about like the wealthy people. Maybe they would hear our message and wouldn't mind sitting down talking with us so we can really bring the homicide rate down in Chicago for once and for all. And we feel that if Rahm's yeah. friends are complaining to him about people disturbing their lives, then he'll finally listen and we can have not a chit chat, but transform uh, transformational and transactional conversations, discussions. You know, these schools that have been closed, repurpose them. Get the Googles, get the Amazons. We want these companies, but they're cash rich, they have tax incentives. Sentence. They're being subsidized by taxpayers and go and create, take these schools and create digital training centers. Hire people from the neighborhood, restabilize these places, have some vision for the poor, but you won't have that if that political will isn't there. So, who are the component groups who'll be marching tomorrow? With us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have Black Lives Matter, Lake County. We have uh, several churches, Lakeview Lutheran Church, uh, right back with Wrigleyville. We have uh, several uh, victims of violence and a few victims of police involved violence. Pastor Acri, Dr. Network. Marshall has the Leaders Network. We have uh, Peter Isan Keller, Eric Russell, Tree of Life Justice League of Illinois. And we have countless people that are coming out. We've had people to secure buses for us. So we're looking for a very peaceful demonstration to get our message out uh, tomorrow. Any outsiders, any people coming from out of town? We, we've received uh, on Facebook, uh, by Ron, 2019, uh, we received so many different people that want to come and help, and they, they, they come. Is that a good thing? I yeah. mean, is that something that Chicago should welcome, or is this a Chicago issue that should stay Chicago? Well, Richard J. Daley didn't like the fact that King was an outsider. You know, he hated that, and he threatened all the churches that if you let King in your church, I'm going to cut you off. Reverend Clay Evans, his steel structure stood there for seven years without building permits because he allowed King to speak in his church. But it was a sacrifice worth having, and so we invite anyone. We don't look at the label. We look at the human being. Plus, the message is universal. And see, plus, whenever I organize an event, I'm very disciplined, very disciplined. So we, we're not looking for anybody to be arrested, okay? We're not looking for any clashes with the people here. We come in peace. But, but there have been some reports that conflict with that, Tia, that, that? That, there, that there was an expectation that you two had for well, some well, arrests. Well, he, he's saying it no, one way, and we're on the same page, because I'm taking the Kingsian view and Gandhi that, you know, you don't have to be uh, at the march. Uh, uh, being arrested is not a requirement to be at the march. But if you want to get arrested, you can get arrested because Dr. King and Gandhi said, look, if we can fill the jails, what do they do with the rest of us? The people really have to make a statement here. So again, a requirement to get arrested isn't there, but we're, this is civil disobedience. Do you, do you want to be arrested? Oh, I, I, it would be an honor. It would be an honor. It really would. Same thing for you? I'm not trying to get arrested. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. You I'm, get no, me let out. me say this here. I'm T.O. Hardiman. <laughs> T.O. Hardman getting arrested, there's, there's, the media will put a different spin on it, okay? I'm a black man in America. I do not want to get arrested. Okay, so they there's a not, difference look, here between the no, organizers. No, we're on the same page. I want to make that clear. Let me say arrested. this here. Let me say this. They did not arrest Father Flager and anybody on the Dan Ryan, so they shouldn't even think about arresting uh, 
black organizers that are organizing a peaceful demonstration in Chicago to bring attention to all the issues here that we're talking about right now. It is it fair to say that you didn't approve of Father Flager's march? No, I support Father Flager. I want to make that clear on, on television tonight. Flager has skin in the game. He's put in work. So I'm not against Father Flager. I didn't like the fact that Father Flager kind of denounced what we were doing, but I'm not going to fight with Father Flager. I don't, grown he men don't do that. He said he disagreed with that. I didn't see him denounce it, but he said right. that he was taking a different approach. Well, I think we're taking the same approach if you look at it. We're fighting for economic development. We, we, once we again, just called a couple We have of qualified names. black leaders in Chicago that can organize on behalf of the African American community. That message needs to get out there in the strongest possible way. And we need all hands on deck. This problem that we have in the city requires many groups to get involved in attacking this on different fronts. No one group or one person is going to be able to do this because it's a huge problem. So am I correct in hearing that there was a report that Willie Wilson, who was previously in this newscast, has promised to bail the two of you out if it needs? No, he, he's promised to bail everybody out. So if we're drowning and somebody <laughs> throws me a lifesaver, I ain't looking at who it is. I'm just going to grab it. And, and I would like to be out if, once I go in. But you want to go in bef and then come out? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's an honor. King went to jail. You know, I mean, I mean, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, I mean, folk, you know, the folk in Tiananmen Square, we're, we stand in a crowd of great witnesses. We want to do our part. Is part of the plan to get into Wrigley Field? Oh, I don't know. Well, if you don't know, who does? Well, you have to wait and see. We, we're like a football team. Well, that's in a, kind of coy, isn't well, it? Well, it's like a football team in a huddle. We can't tell the defense what we're doing. You know, we're, we're up against a formidable foe. They have more money, resources, everything. So we have to be cunning. So is part of your cunning, Mr. Hardiman, to get into Wrigley Field? <laughs> no, I'm straightforward with everybody. Everybody knows me in Chicago. I have no intentions of going to Wrigley Field, but I'm with the pastor. We're talking about the issue. And one thing I would like for people to do as well, I'm not a protester or a community activist. I'm a professional African-American leader, CEO of my own organization. I have a master's degree, and I'm also an adjunct professor. You know, I ran for governor. So I would like to inspire the next generation to be the best that, that they can become. But we need to make sure that we have the resources in the African-American community the same way they have resources uh, distributed throughout the entire city of Chicago. Both of you have run for political office before. Is this yeah, that's what part... you want to call it, yeah. Well, you ran for alderman. Yeah, right, right, You've right, run right. for governor. Right. I, is this an extension of your own political aspirations, either of you? Not for me it is. You know, I'm, I'm a pastor. I don't consider myself an activist either. This is public right. ministry for me, advocating for the public good. Right. And we were doing the Laquan McDonald piece, and then Will Burns resigned, and that became open as a platform. As an alderman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so, and, but, you know, when the president stepped in and everything else, you know, we didn't really have a chance after that. Just like Rahm, you know, when Barack comes, you're going to win. Because he supported Sophia King, who, yes. who, got, who got that job. Yeah, I, I wasn't the, uh, the, uh, the fair-haired boy in, the, in that race, no. Political aspirations yeah. for no, you, no, an extension uh, of that? No, zero political aspirations for me. It takes Any too more? Well, no, it takes too much money, but I'll tell you something. I'm the guy, if I didn't have a couple of issues in my life, I would run for president <laughs> of the United States. I'm serious, but I'm not going to run. But no, there's no political interest here for T.O. Hardiman. It just costs too much money to run for governor, and uh, right now, you know, that's just the way I look at it. How do you see this ending tomorrow? I mean, what's, how does it conclude at the end of the day? This is a series of events. What we want are these demands to be discussed, and we want to sit with the decision makers, not with the messengers. We have clear-cut demands, and so, you know, we, we, we have to have a real conversation. And you think this demonstration will force that conversation? Because you haven't wanted to have the conversation at this right. moment. Well, if this one does not, the next one will. If the next one does not, the next one will. We have to keep applying the pressure. Because, you know, if Dr. King could do this in a southern environment in his time, my gosh, what can we do now? We got cell phones, you know? So, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a different world in some ways. But we're going to just keep pushing and keep inspiring the uninspired to let them know you can make a difference. Well, thank you both for being here, Gregory Seal Livingston yes, and T.O. Hardiman. We appreciate your time. And the thank great Carol so Marie. That's right. <laughs> There's much more to come on Chicago Tonight. Stay with us.
East meets West in an art show that began with a collection of photos found at an estate sale. Jeffrey Baird takes a look back at those colorful cows on parade that graced the city nearly 20 years ago in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. And only two libraries in the world hold handwritten Beatles lyrics in their collections. Northwestern University is one of them. But first, a new report by the apartment search service Rentop ranks Chicago the, quote, rat capital of the country. To come to that conclusion, the, the report looked at the number of rat complaints in four cities. It found Chicago had the most complaints in 2017, followed by New York City, Washington, D.C., and Boston. Even after looking at the number of complaints based on each city's population, Chicago still ranked number one. Here to help separate fa Chicago rat facts from Chicago rat fiction is Don Opitz. He is an associate professor and interim dean at DePaul University School for New Learning. He teaches a course on understanding Chicago's rats from a cultural, environmental, and urban policy perspective. And Don Opitz, welcome to Chicago tonight. First of all, this isn't the first time that Chicago has been named the rattiest city in the country. What makes this study different from the others? All right, th yeah. Um, no, indeed not. So Chicago has held the honor of being the radiest city in the United States for quite a few years now. Uh, this study is interesting because unlike former uh, studies that rank Chicago number one, uh, this one looked at Chicago, City of Chicago data, uh, rat complaints, as opposed to uh, receipts for rat treatments uh, that, uh, through uh, pest control. Um, so the former, uh, stu for former rankings of Chicago's number one came from Orkin. This is coming from an independent uh, analysis based on uh, city data. And city data, that is to say, complaints made to uh, 311. That's right. Okay, so let's assume that uh, this data is being f accurately interpreted, fairly analyzed. Why would Chicago have more rat complaints anyway than other cities? Uh, so that's a, a great question, and I, I think it's a really key point. Um, so what this study is showing is that we don't really know if Chicago has more rats than other cities. Um, in fact, I would highly doubt that the rat population is higher in Chicago than, say, New York. Um, but it does seem to be the case that we have more rat complaints. What does that mean? Do Chicagoans like to complain more than uh, those in New York? Um, or is it that the, uh, sorry, Chicago has a, a stronger uh, reporting system and has done some good education around that system? Um, I also uh, believe that it's true that rat complaints have gone up over the last few years, and you know that's clearly borne out by the data. So what is it that's happening, uh, you know, over these years uh, to encourage more uh, reports of uh, rat sightings? Uh, you know, more complaints about rats. Is it really the case that we're seeing more rats or are people just starting to get fed up and wanting to, you know, make sure that the city is aware? So there's not necessarily a correlation by, uh, between the number of complaints and a, uh, and a large, uh, an excessively large, notably large rat population. But there are three neighborhoods that top the list of the most complaints and those neighborhoods are Logan Square, Englewood, and West Ridge. Why might these three neighborhoods uh, be the source of the most complaints about rats? Another uh, great question, Phil. Uh, you know, it, it is the case that uh, in Logan Square, there's been a lot of development in recent years. It's also known that uh, development disturbs uh, rat uh, nests and rat burrows. Um, I, I believe that it was the case over in, in, in the same time period, so in 2017, uh, Logan Square uh, saw more demolition than any other neighborhood in the city of Chicago. And when you demolish buildings, what happens? You're also demolishing the uh, nests where rat colonies are living. But how about those uh, other neighborhoods, uh, Englewood and West, West Ridge? What might explain uh, the number of complaints in those communities? Right. Well, so Englewood, and I'm just going to speculate here, um, is a, a neighborhood that is, um, you know, economically um, not, not as well off as other neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, it is the case that there seems to be a slight correlation between, uh, you know, the number of rat complaints and 
median uh, rent, uh, you know, the cost of rent in a, in a neighborhood. What's that? What's the relationship? So the more complaints that you have, um, the lower the rent, uh, the, the lower the uh, the rent is in the neighborhood. And because low rent could be a reflection of a lot of things. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. Uh, well, is, is it really possible to meaning, meaningfully measure a city's rat population? So I've been reflecting upon this, actually, in preparation for tonight. And what, what, what I would like to say is that um, it's a good thing that Chicago has a good reporting system. It's a good thing that people of Chicago are uh, submitting complaints. And, um, I, and, I, and I, I, just because we have more complaints this year than in previous years, um, it could mean that the system is working. It's notoriously difficult to measure rat populations. Um, there's no re real direct way to, to do that. Complaints are one measure of getting at that population, but it's not a reliable measure. There's also a correlation, apparently, uh, between the number of rat complaints and neighborhoods where people complain about dog droppings. Uh, ex expand on that if it's not too, if it's not too obvious. Right. Um, so it, it's also known that a contributor to uh, rat populations is the availability of food. Uh, so, you know, restaurant districts tend to be uh, popular areas that rats like to visit. Um, but dog feces is a form of food for rats, and it is the case that when there is a lot of dog droppings out and about, um, you're likely to see rats. There's one breed of rats in Chicago. Um, there's not multiple. Tell us about the breed in Chicago and what some of their characteristics are. Uh, great question. Um, so in general, there's two popular breeds of rats. Um, there's Rattus norvegicus, the Norway rat, uh, the brown rat. This is the rat that is uh, common in Chicago and in most cities of the United States. The other rat is the black rat, Rattus rattus, and it's a rat that is in the United States but tends to uh, be more prevalent on the West Coast. It's also known as the tree rat because it likes to climb. Brown rats do not like to climb trees. Chicago rats do not like to climb trees. They're good climbers, but they prefer to burrow. I see. So uh, some of their characteristics in terms of lifespan, their ability to reproduce and so forth? Yeah, so rats have short lifespans. Um, feral rats will live as long as a year. Um, but they're really good reproducers. Uh, they can have up to eight litters a year, and they have up to 12 pups per litter. So we're talking 90s, almost 100 rats, 100 pups that a rat can produce. That's right. And in terms of their intelligence, because we hear so much about this. They're very smart. Give me an example of how <laughs> smart they are. Just how smart are they? <laughs> So rats also uh, are famous for making good pets. Um, I personally have friends who have pet rats. Um, I, when I taught my class, I had the rats visit the class. Um, they're uh, very uh, um, intelligent. Um, they're very aware of their surroundings. Uh, they're very social beings. Um, they're very smart. They, they, know, they can remember um, details about their environment. Uh, rats are known to be neophytes. They're, they're afraid of what's, uh, things that are new. And so they're creatures of habit. Uh, when they're out and about, they tend to follow the same pathways uh, for safety reasons. Uh, they tend to stay away from new things in their environment. This is why uh, baitings of rats um, aren't always so effective um, because, again, that's something that's foreign being introduced into their environment. Would you say, how would you assess the job that the city of Chicago is doing to control the rat population? Chicago has been pouring more and more resources um, as these complaints have gone up. Um, I admire uh, that there is a rat program in Chicago that uh, is uh, very broad-based. Um, it involves waste management, which is very key uh, to controlling rat populations. And we're seeing here the, uh, the, the uh, spreading of, of poison pellets uh, by, the, by city crews. Um, steps that residents can take to keep rats away from their property? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that residents can do is first uh, contain their, their trash. Uh, overflowing trash bins are a ripe source for attracting rats. rats. 
um, being mindful of uh, uh, holes in buildings um, and garages um, that provide access uh, for rats to, to get indoors. Um, getting rid of piles of uh, debris and wood and, uh, you know, weeding, you know, that sort of thing. In, order, in, in other words, you know, removing food sources, picking up after the, your, your dog, um, you know, coming back to the dog feces. <laughs> um, so it, it's really about um, changing the environment so that you're making it not so rat friendly. Uh, it, tell, tell me, we're almost out of time, but real quickly, what is your class about? It's called Rats in the City. Uh, what do you teach? Who takes that course? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking. Um, so this is an introduction to the liberal arts and it, it involves um, introducing uh, a, a problem. So rats in the city is a problem and examining that problem through three different lenses and in this case urban ecology, cultural studies and public policy. The students in the class are required to do some kind of community engagement as part of their uh, assignments. And so I have had students that have uh, contacted the city of Chicago and looked at their data and, and done reports. And like we saw with rent, uh, renthop.com. Well, it's a subject that all Chicagoans are interested in. Uh, Don Opitz, thank you so much for joining us. Very much appreciate you giving us your time and your insights. My pleasure. An enduring local mystery has evolved into an art show with a global reach. 20, 27 years ago, a suburban couple found a box of photographs at an estate stay, sale. Those photos taken in 1945 by a U.S. serviceman have now inspired a gallery of artwork made by contemporary artists from India. Here's Jay Shevsky with the story. At the Loyola University Museum of Art, the works currently on view were inspired by a collection of photographs, pictures that were found in a shoebox under a couch at an estate sale. We pulled out the shoebox and inside we found these brown envelopes that had negatives, four by five inch negatives, a professional press photographer negatives, um, and vintage prints stapled to them. There were 127 of them in the box. They were gorgeous photographs, just gorgeous, of temples and portraits and just very, very cool stuff. We still don't know who the photographer is. But we did find out through our research that they were taken at the Salua Air Base, which is um, in Karakpur, which is just a little bit southwest of Kolkata. And in 1945, um, the Americans had a secret air base there. And that's where a lot of the B-29 bombers would come and get refueled and get, um, get serviced, and then they would load up bombs and go to Japan. The couple spent months in India researching the photographs, and they dreamed up an artful idea. And we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we took these photographs and placed them in front of some Indian artists and say, well, you respond to them. You know, what do you think? Um, what is it about these images that, that captures you? We collected a group of 10 Indian artists that were all Bengali. Right. We decided to stay in that area because yeah. that's where they were from. And so we just kept building this up and building this up and began to work with these artists who then developed their own interpretations of these photographs. And that's, that's really the key of this whole thing, is that it wasn't just, oh, we found these cool photos and we're showing the photos. The idea is that we found the photos, we're bringing them back to the, to the, to the yeah. subjects, and we're saying, well, what do you think about this? The works are amazing, and I was really excited about the different types of works um, shown in the exhibit. I mean, one of the things people don't understand in India is it's not this monolithic culture. It's very, very layered, it's very diverse, and my students don't get that. But when they come and see this, they're, you know, they're floored. What was so marvelous about this is the variety of responses. No two people saw the same thing. Everybody responded in a different way. They used their own artistry and their own uh, abilities and their own personal histories in order to tell those stories. Works range from large-scale installations with video, to graphic arts, to traditional folk paintings. The curators included works of their own among the contributions of the ten contemporary Indian artists. Of course, some of the 127 photos that inspired the project are also on view. They were taken by a photographer with an empathetic eye. So here we have someone 
giving a connection with the people, trying to show an everyday life, not some sensationalist nonsense. So he lacks that, um, that colonial gaze. It has that power structure in there. But then bringing the photographs back to the artist, it's kind of like flipping the narrative. It gives the artist so much agency. Like they're allowed to interpret that instead of having the West interpret them. Following the box of photographs has led to an intriguing art show. But one question remains the identity of the photographer. We solved the mystery of where it was taken, but we didn't solve the mystery of who he was or why, you know, he took these photos. Which is just an amazing story. And if story. only we can find yeah, his relatives to just, just to say to them, Thank you. you know, <laughs> Look what this guy did. you have affected thousands of lives. We found this at an estate sale, you know, in a shoebox, under a couch. And, and the message really is that there are great hidden stories everywhere, just everywhere. You just have to take the time to look. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shefsky. The exhibition is called Following the Box. It was previously on view at two museums in India. Now it is in Chicago at LUMA, the Loyola University Museum of Art, through October 20th. And there's more to be seen on our website. And up next, visiting some of the remaining cows on parade in an encore presentation of Ask Jeffrey. Coverage of the arts on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Russell and Josephine Cott Memorial Charitable Trust, enhancing services, quality programs, and capacity building for agencies serving seniors. 20 years after it stampeded down Michigan Avenue, Chicagoans are still moved by the memory of the Cows on Parade art project. And a viewer asks, how now, Chicago cows? Jeffrey Bear is here with the answer to that and other utterly fascinating questions in tonight's edition of Ask Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey, I'll stop now with those. Uh, I don't those see how <laughs> I can top that, Phil. <laughs> All right, well, let's get, let's get to the uh, first question, and it is, today on it, I unexpectedly came across one of the cows from Cows on Parade on a Balcony of the house on the northeast corner of Clark and Dickens Street in Lincoln Park. Are there any more of those cows still parading around Chicago? And of course, you remember cows on parade. Can you believe that that was almost 20 years ago? It has been a while, but no, they made quite a splash. They, they Mixing did. metaphors. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to even go there either. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so uh, let's take a look at the cow that our viewers spotted. There it is uh, in Lincoln Park. We tracked down um, a few more that are still around Chicago, and we will show you those in a minute. Um, these, this uh, display, the display of decorated fiberglass cows, uh, took Chicago by storm. It was the summer of 1999, with over 300, mostly along Michigan Avenue, uh, 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 the museum campus and the loop. Were well, the cows a reference to the legend of Mrs. O'Leary and her infamous cow? That was my assumption. Actually, no. Um, Chicago shoe mogul Peter Hainig brought the idea to Chicago in 1998 after he saw a similar display in Zurich, Switzerland, a city famed for its dairy production. Hainig and legendary Chicago cultural historian, uh, uh, cultural affairs commissioner Lois Weisberg uh, lined up a herd of sponsors and artists. Um, the Chicago cows were actually made by the same Swiss manufacturer, and Phil, that's why they have horns, because the Swiss don't remove their cows' horns as is commonly done here in the United States. Um, the artists could choose from three poses, head up, head down or lying down, and uh, they were paid $1,000 for their work dressing up the cows in a wild assortment of themes. So have all these cows moved on to greener pastures? <laughs> well, um, after the show was over, most of the cows were auctioned off and the money was um, uh, went to the charity of the sponsor's choice. Um, a few cows are still uh, in Chicago. One of them is climbing the walls at the Talbot Hotel. I actually had my wedding night in that hotel and I remember that cow. Um, it's by uh, artist Brian Calvin, and it's titled Cousinella Novem Notata, which is a play on the scientific name for the nine-spotted ladybug. This one by artist Ed Paschke is titled Vaca Victoria, and it's at the Ed Paschke Art Center in Jefferson Park. Now, it, you might remember it aroused controversy because it included gang symbols on the mm. cow, mm. Um, but the art center says that Paschke's intent was just to depict unity in the city after six Bulls championships. Two cows graze at CTA headquarters on Lake Street, 
On the lower level, artist Kermit Berg's visual cacophony in six movements is visible from the street. A cow on the second floor is titled Get on the Bus. It was painted by a group of Gallery 37 artists. We actually have a few more of the cows on our website, so viewers can go to the website and, and see those. Um, and we also on the website put a feature from 1999 that first aired on our series Art Beat Chicago, which I produced and at one time you hosted, Phil. Boy, that is a walk down memory lane. Yes, sir. <laughs> Um, uh, the display's uh, uh, tremendous popularity did spawn some cowpeacat projects um, for the next 12 years across the United States and even um, other world cities put on cow displays. And like other cities, um, Chicago has hosted different objects since then, including, as you see here, horses, globes, fire painted fire hydrants and most recently the artistic animals people are spotting on Chicago streets are not cows but canines about a hundred fiberglass German shepherds were sponsored to benefit the police memorial foundation and the group Paws Chicago these are fun aren't they to see uh, to see these unusual objects or unexpected objects in the street and then uh, the gifts of local artists. Uh, honestly, I think that was Lois Weisberg's you know real genius was how to engage the public in art. Very good. Our next question comes from Lombard. There is an otherwise unremarkable three-story apartment building near Midway Airport with three large concrete plaques depicting monkeys that speak no evil, hear no evil, and see no evil. Why would anyone do this, and <laughs> who was it? Good question. Um, so let's take a look at the building uh, in question at 5516 South Pulaski, built in 1955, according to county records. And there they are, the three wise monkeys embodying the proverbial admonition, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Um, we spoke to a local stone carver named Walter Arnold who uh, said that they're actually not concrete uh, but limestone carvings. He said at the time they were made there were a handful of stone mills around Chicago. They could have made them. But the plaques are unsigned so we can't say for sure who it was. And we also can't say for sure why this set of monkeys is there on those buildings. But we can say that they're not the only monkeys hanging around Chicago. Our sleuth uh, producer Erica Gunderson found a number of other ones. We spotted very similar monkeys on this three flat in the Irving Park neighborhood, built in 1959. Uh, they're not identical in design, but you can see the monkeys are very similarly carved and the backgrounds share some elements. Like the sunburst, the leaves, and yeah. the cobblestones. Yeah. You know, maybe IKEA had a sale. Yeah, on I don't these know. Or something. They, they could have been stock items that mm. different, you know, builders picked up on. I really don't know. I have not seen them at Home Depot. Yeah, That's not true. there. <laughs> Certainly not there. Um, the plaques are also aped on a larger scale on three 1957 buildings in suburban River Forest. Uh, we were able to find out a little bit more about these buildings, actually. They were built by an Oak Park contractor named Angelo Esposito in a 1959 Chicago Tribune article about the River Forest buildings. Um, Esposito said that there was no special reason for the monkey theme, despite some suggestions that it might have been intended to depict, you know, like a good neighbor policy. Esposito was quoted as saying, the fact that it has created talk and interest indicates the idea accomplished what it was meant to do. Did Esposito build the other monkey-themed buildings that we've seen? <clears throat> well, the architectural style among all three of these buildings is similar, as a mid-century modern, uh, but we can't uh, document that Esposito's company actually built them. However, he did say in 1959 in an interview that his company had built buildings uh, with similar ornamental sculpture. Well, I didn't know we'd, uh, y you know a lot about Chicago architectures. This is the first time hearing of Chicago's monkey period. There you go. <laughs> the, the monkey school of architecture, yes. <laughs> that's, that's right. Jeffrey, thank you very much. My pleasure. Hoof it over to our website to find out where you can spot more of the cows and for more information on these and other Ask Jeffrey questions. And milk your visit for all it's worth by sending in your questions about Chicago to Jeffrey Bear. And we're back right after this. Ask Jeffrey on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Benny's Beverage Depot. In 1948, Benny's Beverage Depot opened its first store down the street from Wrigley Field. And for almost 70 years, Benny's mission has remained the same, helping you celebrate the best times of your life. A local institution holds precious pieces of paper belonging to the biggest selling pop music artists of all time. We recently got a rare glimpse of this collection of cultural artifacts and here's Paris Schutz with another look at this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 
As a touring band, the Beatles visited Chicago three times to play at two Southside venues that no longer exist. The International Amphitheater in 1964 and 1966 and Comiskey Park in 1965. But in a way, the Fab Four never really left the Chicago area. That's because the personal handiwork of John Lennon and Paul McCartney resides at Northwestern University's Music Library in Evanston. Sure, we're looking at what we call the Beatles manuscripts. We have seven lyric sheets of some very well-known Beatles songs from the Revolver Rubber Soul period. Specifically, the library holds the original lyric sheets for six songs from the 1966 album Revolver. Eleanor Rigby, I'm Only Sleeping, Yellow Submarine, Good Day Sunshine, And Your Bird Can Sing, and For No One, as well as the lyrics for The Word from 1965's Rubber Soul. Northwestern is one of just two libraries in the world which possess handwritten Beatles lyrics. The other is the British Library, the United Kingdom's National Library. There are a lot of lyric sheets like this out there, but they're held in private hands. In the mid-1960s, American composer John Cage was amassing hundreds of manuscripts from composers around the world. Cage already knew Yoko Ono and asked for her help. With his friendship with Yoko Ono, he said, hey, would it be possible if we had some Beatles things for this project? So she was able to, to uh, get these from the Beatles and give them to Cage. Identified as an institution with a robust music library, Northwestern was gifted the Beatles manuscripts by Cage in 1973. Beatles historian and author Robert Rodriguez was utterly amazed by the artifacts. I haven't been doing the Beatles stuff for as long as I had. I didn't expect to have the reaction when I was in their physical presence that I did, but I could feel my heart beating faster. I mean, it was like getting a letter from Abraham Lincoln or something. One thing that stands out is the ordinary and unconventional forms of stationery Lennon and McCartney scrawled their pop masterpieces onto. That's an envelope John had written in the back of a bill that he found in his car, um, another envelope, and these here that are taken from spiral notebooks. It really speaks to the fact that the Beatles were working on the fly. These songs emerged from a pivotal period when the Beatles were evolving from touring pop stars to sophisticated songwriters in the studio. Playing the part of pop psychologist, Rodriguez distinguishes between Lennon and McCartney's writing. You can definitely tell John's handwriting is distinct from Paul's. John Lennon seemed to be mostly aware of himself and living in his own head always and didn't necessarily think in terms of presentation. Whereas Paul, you always get sort of a self-consciousness aspect to him. So it's possible in the handwriting of these, he might be thinking someday somebody's going to look at this, even if it's the next day when they're in the studio. Yeah, as opposed to John who's just getting what's in his head onto paper. But distinctive styles didn't stop collaboration. Eleanor Rigby. It was George that came up with the, the refrain of, ah, look at all the lonely people. It was Ringo that came up with the plot point of Father Mackenzie darning his socks in the night. Along with discarded lyrics, doodles, and chord notations, the lyric sheets display the group's well-known wit. Well, what we do know about Yellow Submarine, Paul wrote it as a kid's song for Ringo to sing, but you also see some lines that ended up in the final song scratched out, and little notations, disgusting, see me like a school teacher would write on something being handed in by a student. That's something I would love to know. What was disgusting and who needed to see whom about that? And some musical markings on Good Day Sunshine may be sarcastic. The lads from Liverpool had no formal musical training. You get the sense they're being ironic there, throwing around musical lingo that they don't understand. And especially because it begins forte, fortas, that's not a musical term, and then <laughs> Fortissimos, also not a musical term. Visually, one of the songs stands out from the rest. The word, Paul did the artwork, but it's pretty certain it's John's handwriting for the lyrics themselves. The word, the word is love. Not typical pop band stuff of the mid-60s, but here it is. And it also clearly physically stands out as being the most colorful of the lot. By his own admission, the doodler was under the influence. In his official 1997 biography, Many Years From Now, McCartney says, we smoked a bit of pot, then we wrote out a multicolored lyric sheet, the first time we'd ever done that. Paul was a 
a huge consumer of, of weed throughout the duration of his working years. And, um, you know, you get high, you got a handful of markers, you're gonna do stuff. While you can't see the originals in person, Northwestern does have high quality scans of the lyric sheets on permanent display. McHale says Northwestern owns the manuscripts and plans to hold on to them forever. That's a wise decision, according to Rodriguez. This is a very important piece of our cultural history residing for all time in Chicago. You know, the power of the Beatles story, it appeals to every demographic and you can't quantify it. Yeah, they made good music, they had charisma, they influenced haircuts and style. It's bigger than that. If there's such thing as being touched by the hand of God, they were it. Some kind of For Chicago Tonight, this is Paris Shuts. You don't know what it's like. And for those keeping tabs, the Beatles' Revolver, Revolver album was released 52 years ago this month. Wow. And how much are those Beatles manuscripts worth? Northwestern says altogether the seven original lyric sheets could fetch anywhere from seven to fifteen million dollars based on previous auction sales. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our eight daily e-alert. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. We will bring you the latest from the March on Lakeshore Drive and on through Wrigleyville. And Jay Shevsky has some close encounters with live bait when he visits the city's oldest bait shop. We leave you with a bit of the high-flying Jesse White tumblers using their skills to raise awareness about organ and tissue donation at the Thompson Center Plaza. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.